A Promise Fulfilled by Andy Clark. A ship approaches, my master. The calling voice shattered Amat's trance as surely as a brick thrown through a sheet of glass. The sorcerer opened his eyes with a heavy sigh. He allowed the strands of empiric energy that he had gathered to unravel, releasing them to flow back into the endless ocean. Thark, we have had this conversation more than once, he said, rising from his knees. The actuators in his turquoise and gold power armor whirred as he moved, and his cloak flowed around him, scintillating through different hues like the plumage of some strange avian. He turned his gaze upon Thark, who stood awkwardly in the door to the meditation cell. The Zangor's beak hung half open and his golden eyes were wide, an expression Amat had learned to interpret as shameful. My master, I am sorry. If you pull me from my trance without the proper ritual, the results could be catastrophic, Amat said. The power that my lord Magnus has gathered in this realm is beyond comprehension. Today I was weaving but the barest strands, easily pacified and released. Had I been channeling greater energies, he let the statement hang unfinished. Amat had long ago learned that, when dealing with the ungifted, a good ominous yet unspecific threat hit home far better than attempting to explain the specifics of his craft. Even in the realm of the Crimson King, we cannot escape the clutches of ignorance and superstition, he thought bitterly. Thark had fallen to his knees and was now pressing his bestial face to the floor. He was emitting a crooning sound that Amat knew denoted great displeasure or possibly fear. I am blasphemed, I will do penance, he croaked. Amat crossed the chamber in a few strides and gently lifted Thark's beak with the butt of his staff. There will be no need for that, he said, forcing his impatience not to creep into his tone. You mentioned a ship, Thark? Yes, my master, a ship has come. The Zangor scrambled up, his blue and white robes flapping about his wiry, half-avian body. Acolyte Shara spoke with its captain. It is docked upon the spur. The rubrique got it. Its passengers await your pleasure. Amat took a deep and slow breath, then nodded. New arrivals, they are late. Fast of seeing suggested that the ship will reach us days ago. Unless, I suppose, that ship was lost altogether, and these are our next guests presenting themselves instead. Amat mused. The Empyrean is fickle, Thark. We can but strive to read its shifting currents. Yes, my master, Thark said, with what Amat suspected was more reverence than comprehension. No matter, let us welcome them said Amat, sweeping from the chamber with Thark close behind. The sorcerer had walked the halls and chambers of this isolated tower for months now, and could have navigated its winding stairways and arched passages with his eyes closed. Still, he opened his senses to every detail. Amat soaked in the crumbling texture of the stonework and the smooth cold of the white marble columns. He listened for patterns in the echoes of his armored footfalls as they receded into the fortress's depths. He tasted every chemical tang, every droplet of sweat and wisp of incense that hung upon the recycled air, and allowed it to inform him as the changer of the ways saw fit. Such was the way of the cult of knowledge. There were secrets in all things and wisdom to be gleaned from every waking moment. One simply had to open one's eyes and see. Yet our enemies will not see, he thought to himself, with an uncharacteristic flare of anger. They cannot. Their ignorance is so deeply ingrained that it has become as natural as breathing. That is why we shall defeat them in the end. That is why their most gifted flee to us for sanctuary. By the time Amat reached the atmospheric exchanger shrine, he had gathered a coterie of Sangor and golden mast cultists, who clutched autoguns and curved daggers. Many displayed the Cyclops mark, as it had come to be known of late. They had put out their own right eyes in imitation of the Crimson King, as a sign of their devotion. Amat found the practice distasteful, but had to admit that it showed great dedication. 
the Crimson King represented hope to them, or what passed for it in this dark age. Two acolytes hurried forward to commune with the shrine's controls. They muttered prayers to its machine spirit as they pressed runic keys and adjusted gem-inlaid dials until, with a hiss and a wash of cold air, the shrine's inner door opened. Amont stepped into the shrine and his coterie came with him. Through the armor glass panel and its outer door he saw a long spit of pipe-inlaid stone that jutted out from the asteroid to form a natural void dock. It was open to the vacuum, the scattered stars and the striated, many-hued nebula of the Prosperin Rift wheeling all about it. The shadow of Amat's armored tower was thrown along the spit in hard relief by the light of Karmok's star, burning bright at its back. Amat glanced around at the cultists surrounding him. The same two acolytes were working the controls again, preparing to close the inner doors and banish the spirits of air, sound, and solidity from its confines. Not one of them so much as glanced at him. They showed no suggestion of nerves. How completely they trust me, he thought, and was surprised to find that the notion made him uncomfortable. Something about it seemed slavish to Amat, and the thousand sons were not slavers. What patterns might I read in their burst and drifting bodies? whispered another part of his mind. What wisdom might I glean from the passing of their mortal sparks? Amat banished that thought with a pang of shock. Too many of his brothers had lost their sanity by walking down just such paths to knowledge. He would not count himself among those lost souls. He raised his staff and chanted a string of complex syllables that seemed to turn in upon themselves and repeat until their jabbering echo filled the chamber. Even as the exchangers hissed and the air spirits screamed away into the void, Amat's sorcery wreathed him and his retinue in a shimmering dome of altered reality. The outer doors yawned like an orc's jaws, and the remaining air whistled away into the void. Killing cold and flesh rupturing, airless nothingness rushed greedily in to take its place. Amat and his acolytes were untouched. "'Come, let us greet our new arrivals,' said Amat, and set off along the spit at a steady stride. His followers stayed close, making sure they remained within the protective aegis of his sorcery, and didn't allow the vast wonder and terror of the void to distract them from their duty. Amat smiled in approval. If he allowed himself to, he might lose himself in the study of the surrounding cosmos for days at a time. He had done so more than once, and was pleased that his acolytes, though mere mortals all, showed the restraint to avoid such a snare. Amat allowed himself a single glance back at the sorcerer's tower to which he had been assigned when the Crimson King had begun his great endeavor. Tall, Twisted and strangely incongruous, where it loomed against the glimmering starfield, it was sheathed in coral blue armor plates. Ethereal flames wreathed its conical peak in a whirlwind of ever changing greens, blues, pinks, purples, and searing yellows. The sorcerer turned back towards where the new arrival's vessel waited, anchored by heavy chains and fuel pipes to the machineries of the spit. Amot was pleased by their arrival yet he felt the weight of the looming choice like a stone in his chest. The sorcerer strode up the armored gangway ramp that had been lowered from one of the vessel's many outer doors. He took a moment to study the craft, a much-abused trading frigate of some mongrel imperial design. The craft's original shape had been lost beneath an accretion of repairs, scavenged components in what looked like battle damage. It has changed as all things must change he thought. Raising his staff, Amat wrapped its butt against the outer door. He struck the ritual nine times. Only once that was done did the door slide upwards to emit the sorcerer and his retinue. Amat released his spell as the ship's exchanger shrine did its work. He tasted the sweet, stale air and the sharp, empiric tang of a craft long at warp. The inner door opened and there stood a Shvirim Del. Once, this man had stood amongst Amat's own circle of acolytes. Now, like the ship aboard which he plied the stars, he had become something else. Savior, said Amat, with a nod and wry smile. My master, Del replied, his blue robes rustling and his amulet shimmering as he bowed low. You have successfully shepherded another band of acolytes into the realm of the Crimson King, said Amat. You have my thanks. They are of an auspicious number. Fate provides, my master, replied Del, 
his own smile hard amidst his clipped white beard. He met Amat's gaze with his single eye and did not flinch. They are ten in number, just as the Primarch predicted. Always ten in number by the time our journeys bring us to the towers. They have developed? asked Amat. They have, my master. Or they have perished in the attempt, Del replied. Amat saw the ghost of something unpleasant flit across his former acolyte's expression, and wondered what horrors the nascent psychers had unleashed or endured during their perilous journey. He was always amazed that any of the shepherds' dangerous cargoes made it to the borders of Magnus's realm alive, yet almost every ship survived, and almost always they bore ten surviving pilgrims, or some multiple of that number. Auspicious, thought Amat again, and felt the weight of his chest grow heavier. He did not relish this. Where are they? the sorcerer asked. Del bowed and gestured towards an opened bulkhead nearby, where crimson illumination shimmered from within. Follow me if you would, my master, he said, and led the way into the chamber beyond. Amat entered at the head of his retinue, and, as he had known it would, his sudden appearance triggered gasps of fear and surprise amongst the pilgrims. There were ten of them, stood in two ranks amidst the crimson glow of alchemical candles and sacred sigils. Each wore frayed blue robes and a simple golden bracelet at each wrist. Each stared back at him with a single left eye, their right lost to the livid scars left by the Savior's blade. Made up of both men and women, they were ragged and malnourished specimens like most imperial citizens, but Amat could sense the raw power within them. It mingled with their fear and their determination to be worthy. Welcome to the realm of the Crimson King, he said, spreading his arms wide. You who stand before me are the gifted few. You are the next step along humanity's path to ascension. My Lord Primarch recognizes your worth, your power, and your value, as I do. Amat saw them relax just a fraction at that, and felt genuine sorrow at what had to come next. His eyes roved across the faces, many of them young, yet seemed with the lines of too many cares, too much suffering. To have come so far, their strength was undeniable. That one, a telepath, he thought, glancing at a wiry young woman with a laborer's bill, perhaps trying to sense my intentions. That one, a beast weird. That one, psycho keen, powerfully so. And you, oh... That is rare. Which would it be, he wondered. Time for the fates to answer him. I regret that one last test lies before you. Before the Crimson King can offer you sanctuary, said Amat, and saw them tense again. Their expressions were wary now. They had learned how cruel this galaxy could be, and that was good. Magnus needed neither fools nor dreamers. Ten of you there are. Yet nine may pass the borders of this realm. The tenth shall travel no further. There must be sacrifice to protect the sanctuary. All must be willing to give up their flesh, their blood, and their gifts if they wish to be part of what Lord Magnus seeks to build. Tell me now, who amongst you will surrender yourselves as sacrifice? Who? will fall, that their comrades may fly. They shifted awkwardly. Some looked crushed, others angry. On a few faces, he saw a calm acceptance, and, for those brave few, Amat's respect grew immeasurably. For an instant, he thought the young telepath was going to step forward. She glanced at the tall lad next to her, swallowed with a dry click, then opened her mouth to speak. He got there first. And as he did, Amat felt the power writhe inside him. A summoner, thought the sorcerer, a channeler of demons. Yes, you are rare indeed, and powerful enough for my purpose. Fate provides. Take me, said the summoner, stepping forward. Chang, no, said the girl, snatching his sleeve. Chang turned and gently prized open her grip. You've given enough, Sia, 
he said, glancing at her empty socket and then away. I... You've seen what my gifts do. I can't live with these nightmares forever, and these other cowards aren't about to give up their lives for the Crimson King. Chang glared round at the other pilgrims. Some met his gaze. Some looked away. I won't let you fall when safety is so close. Not when it could be me instead. Amat felt strands of density spiraling out from this defining moment. Chang, no, you can't, she said. But Amat stepped forward and laid one armored hand gently upon the lad's shoulder. He can and he has, said the sorcerer. He knew that from the moment these pilgrims took ship with their savior, Chang's fate had been sealed. The girl choked back sobs as Del led them all away, out of the chamber and back to their meditation cells. Amat looked down at his sacrifice and saw defiance, sorrow, and fear in the lad's gaze. But there was a kind of peace there too, and the sorcerer welcomed it. Make this count, said the lad, as Amat drew his curved dagger and spoke the words that lit its blue gems with fire. Magnus the Red will make every sacrifice count, said Amat. It is by your blood and the blood of those like you that the enlightenment will come. By the death of those we sacrifice are the soul wards kept strong. That is good, said Cheng, and closed his eyes. I truly hope so, thought Amat, and drew back his knife. Mere minutes later, Dell's ship decoupled its void anchors and retraced its freshly re-blessed fuel hoses. Amat watched the craft as it nosed away from the spit and out into open space, then turned its prow for the shimmering stars that marked the realm of the Crimson King. It lit its engines and began to pull away, and as it did so, Amat's eyes strayed to the new flicker of green-blue flames that danced amidst the hurricane of the warding beacon atop his tower. Magnus will make every sacrifice count he thought again as he watched the soul wards flicker and dance, just one beacon in an ensorcelled boundary that stretched across the stars. We all will. Well, thanks for listening to that one. <laughs> that guy's voice got a little... <laughs> uh, it was interesting. I thought there was going to be more conversation between the bird guy and uh, Amat, but uh, alas, here we are. But... I had good fun with that. Expect these once a week because Black Library Games Workshop likes to put out one of these 40k stories each week on Monday. And so we anticipate these coming out on Wednesdays of each week. Thanks for listening. And as always, feedback is much appreciated.